the 1950s, America had broken free from the shackles of wartime economics. It was walking with the swagger of a nation that had the world by the tail. Scientists had harnessed nuclear energy. Jet-propelled airplanes were breaking speed records, and the race to space was on. But perhaps more than anything else, one thing melded imagination and consumerism, putting this era in perfect context. The concept car. Unlike satellites, rockets, and jet planes, these dream cars were accessible. People flocked to auto shows to see concept cars in their titanium-bodied glory. They were snapshots of how America perceived its future. They were simply out of sight, unforgettable. But what happened to them? Most were destroyed, some just plain vanished. But amazingly, some are still here. Introducing Studebaker's 1947 Woody Station Wagon. A car that survived 20 years in a forest. Sat out through every Indiana cycle, and uh, the elements were not kind to the body, because there was no chassis underneath, so it was literally sitting up to its haunches in mud. And introducing the 1953 Buick Wildcat. A car that snuck out the back door. If they were politically connected, they would have somebody, an executive, say, I'm going to sign this car out for you. You take it home. I don't want to hear about it for 25 years or until I'm dead. The Studebaker Brothers Manufacturing Company got their start in 1852, building covered wagons for miners, farmers, and the military. Their sturdy wooden wagons helped open up the western half of the continent. Ninety-five years later, they developed another wooden vehicle, one they hoped would open up new markets. In the 1940s, Studebaker was a mid-sized car maker looking to expand. Studebaker was about 4% of the market, but they were looking to make a big splash after World War II. They had uh, Raymond Lowy working on a series of all new designs for the company. Raymond Lowy was a groundbreaking designer. He was called the father of industrial design. and the man who shaped America. They were offering a full line of uh, automobiles, you know, convertibles, uh, four-door sedans, the Land Cruiser, their stretched uh, four-door model, and also offered a full line of trucks, so really the station wagon was the logical next step for, for them in the market. Lowy wasn't interested in building just another station wagon. He created a Woody. The wood-bodied station wagon had been around for a number of years and was really an outgrowth of the carriage making industry. A lot of manufacturers were using a lot of wood in building their automobiles, so really uh, building a station wagon out of wood was just a logical progression. Studebaker's version was a second generation Woody, a kind of hybrid. The original Woodies were, in some cases, all wood from the cowl back. But really, the Studebaker Woody is much more of a composite structure. The doors have a lot of wood in there, but there's a steel superstructure underneath the entire car. 
The Studebaker Champion Deluxe Station Wagon, to use its official name, uh, was slated to be part of the model lineup. In fact, they showed it at their original model showing. It's even mentioned in the owner's manuals for 1947. There's instructions for the Woody. But at the last minute, Studebaker elected not to put it into production. Despite the public demand for large family vehicles, Studebaker opted to produce a much smaller, sportier car. They were taxing the plant capacity pretty strongly and they had you know, enough room left to either build a convertible or the station wagon and they elected to go with the convertible. Helping them make that decision was that the convertible could be made with existing factory equipment. With a steel car and they're stamping pieces of sheet metal out of, you know, out of big presses and everything's the same, you weld it up, uh, you know, it's just repetition. With the wood, you really have to shave each piece of wood, match it to the metal to make it fit. And it's a very painstaking uh, craftsman project and it would have been a lot more labor intensive for Studebaker and they just apparently did not want to devote the resources towards doing that. That left the prototype an orphan. Just because they didn't put it into production doesn't mean it wasn't a good car. In fact, the prototype ended up with more miles on it than most cars on the road. Studebaker used it as an engineering department runaround vehicle until the early 1950s. And it was not uh, uncommon to see the car tooling around town or back and forth from Studebaker's engineering building to their company proving grounds, which were uh, just outside of town. Uh, but in the 1950s, about 1955, they had logged about 80,000 miles on the car. It, I guess, was getting worn out, so they took the body off the chassis and tossed it into the infield of the company's proving ground test track. That's where it sat for the next quarter century, neglected and exposed to Indiana's brutal winter weather. It sat out through every, every Indiana cycle and uh, the elements were not kind to the body because there was no chassis underneath, so it was literally sitting up to its haunches in mud. Over the years, a forest grew around it and the other derelict car bodies left in the field. Eventually, the giant pile of metal and wood was hidden from sight and forgotten. That would have been the end of the line for the Woody, if not for a handful of Studebaker collectors that were willing to do whatever it took to recover this piece of history. Armed with uh, pickup trucks, chainsaws, and uh, you know, lots of warm clothing and keeping the eye out for snakes and spiders and whatnot, it was just as much uh, archeology span as retrieval in some cases. Getting it out of the forest only took a day. Restoring it took considerably longer. The car was basically rusted out from the belt line down with no chassis underneath it and the floor pan was completely gone and the wood pieces were mostly rotted. Uh, but we had about a dozen pictures and uh, a very hardworking crew who labored on the car for about the next uh, dozen years getting it back to the point where it is as we see it here. Restoring a concept car is unlike any other car project you could undertake. There's nothing standard on a prototype because the original builders were making everything by hand. The roof is fabricated from about eight or nine different pieces of sheet metal and then grafted onto the body. The windshield is two inches taller on this car than any other 47 Studebaker, so we had to make sure to uh, salvage the window frame there were little things like the left and right sides are not perfectly symmetrical with one another, which frustrated our woodworking guy to no end as he realized he couldn't just duplicate the one side for the other. He had to fit every piece and every door and every door frame to fit the car. The finished product, a car that started with Raymond Lowy's sketches and ended with dozens of volunteer mechanics, is fully functional and strikingly attractive. Studebaker's motto was always give more than you promise and uh, really that was what every uh, volunteer, everyone who laid a hand or a wrench on the car really went the extra mile and the results are plainly visible with, with how the car turned out.
Studebaker did eventually release a production line of station wagons. And they owned the most beautiful station wagon in the world, the 1954 Studebaker Conestoga. The name Conestoga harkens back to the days of covered wagons. But the 1954 version didn't have a single piece of wood on it, inside or out. That leaves the 1947 concept car as the only Woody Wagon Studebaker ever built. It also means we'll never know what would have happened if they had put it into production. Uh, I think the station wagon would have been a successful product, but it's also hard to argue the raw numbers between that or the convertible, uh, which supposedly was, was a preferred choice. Uh, 47, 8, 9, they sold close to 25,000 convertibles, which was an absolutely astounding number for such a limited car. So you can argue they made the right decision, but boy, I would love to have seen a bunch of these running around uh, today. Six years after Studebaker flirted with the concept of a station wagon made of wood, Buick explored the idea of making a convertible out of fiberglass. It was called the Buick Wildcat, and everything about it was new. The entire body was made of fiberglass, something considered cutting edge at the time. So that was the new medium of the day. It allowed for new flowing lines and daring shapes. It was built to be the star of the General Motors 1953 Motorama show. Concept cars had two jobs. One was advertising. They had to be unique enough to draw attention to the brand. They were also a tool for market research putting new ideas in front of the public to gauge their reaction. It's got a lot of features on it that are interesting. There was the beginning of the portholes here and the fenders uh, for Buick. Eventually, of course, the portholes came off to the side. The wraparound windshield was new. The whole front grille was uh, used in production Buicks. The front grille also includes a tribute to a 1950s TV star. You twist around and twist around with all your might. <laughs> Please, gentlemen, your union isn't that strong. But the big bumperettes in the front, they were called Dagmars. That was after a, an actress who was very voluptuous that uh, became a styling cue not only for Buick, but Cadillac, and eventually even Chevrolet. That's what I call, I think you're all awfully sweet. The car is loaded with tricks, quirky things meant to get people talking. One of those is the cap for the gas tank. It's hidden inside the left tail light. This is how you fill it up, and this is how you cover it up. Lots of cars had a hood ornament on the front. But the Buick Wildcat is the only one in existence that had an identical one on the trunk as well. It's a beautiful uh, emblem, by the way. And uh, it's an interesting styling cue that never took for production. Within a couple of years, tail fins would be dominating the marketplace. But in 53, they were just beginning to find their form. The Wildcat sports four fins all small and rounded. There's an old expression, that car's so big it looks like a boat. And my interpretation of these fins in the back is kind of blending the idea of using airplane styling cues and boat styling cues. So the back end kind of does have kind of a boat look to it, and it also has a aerodynamic look that might have come off uh, airplanes of that period. Unlike a lot of show cars, this one was built to drive. All the gauges in this car work. Everything is hooked up. The clock works, the radio works. Some of the other cars, the gauges were just there for decoration. Even the spare tire is legit. Take a look at this trunk. 
By the way, all the tires on this car are original tires. And this is an original tire here, US Royal Master. But look at the finishing of the car. Look at the detail in the trunk. Despite its popularity, the Buick Wildcat will always be a mere footnote to the Motorama of 1953. It was upstaged by another fiberglass car, the Chevrolet Corvette. The Corvette was so wildly popular, GM pushed it into production that very same year. Starting with 300 of them in 53, production has now reached over 1.3 million making it one of the most successful sport cars in automotive history. While all the attention was focused on the Corvette, the other cars of the show were slated to be destroyed, but not the Wildcat. At General Motors, it was a very political company. And after the shows, the designers, they would go in and say, is there any way I can keep this car from being destroyed? And if they were politically connected, they would have somebody, an executive, say, I'm going to sign this car out for you. You take it home. I don't want to hear about it for 25 years or until I'm dead. The Wildcat was spared the crusher. And in 1986, it landed in Joe Bortz's collection. Restoring it took three years. Along the way, he used some rather unorthodox replacement parts. He said to me, you know, Joe, and I was cooking up a couple hamburgers for myself, and when I lift up the top of the Weber grill, I looked at it, and I said, my God, I bet you this is exactly the diameter of the hubcap. In the early 1950s, American car makers were looking to celebrate. We had just won World War II, and the idea of if you got it flaunted was certainly a driving force at General Motors. GM spared no expense to get their new designs noticed by the buying public. Every year they built a collection of dream cars, and took them around the country in a show called Motorama. It was a spectacle of forward-thinking engineering and space-age design. One of the stars of the 1953 Motorama was a car called the Buick Wildcat. It was big, powerful, and thoroughly modern. With all the eye-catching features the Buick Wildcat had, it would be easy to overlook the hubcaps, but even they had a clever little trick. When the car was moving, they didn't spin. They came up with this idea of what they call rotostatic hubcaps. The hubcap doesn't turn with the wheel. The hubcap is actually attached to the end of the axle. And the reason that they did that was they wanted to be able to cool the brakes. And if you have a induction port at the front of the hubcap and the hubcap spinning, it really doesn't do any good. Problem is, when Joe Bortz got the car, one hubcap was missing. I found a guy in Detroit, and he was known for making up things. I gave him the one rotostatic hubcap, and I said, make me another one. And about six weeks went by, and I get a shipment in from United Parcel. I open up the box, and there's the two hubcaps, chrome-plated, the letters on both the hubcaps, absolutely perfect. And I called the guy up and said to me, you know, Joe, he says, I'm a bachelor, and I have a little balcony on my little condo, and I have one of those little Weber grills. And I was out there cooking up a couple hamburgers for myself, and when I lift up the top of the Weber grill, I looked at it, and I said, my God, I bet you this is exactly the diameter of the hubcap, and it had the right, you know, hump in it and everything, and I took it down to the shop and almost matched up perfectly. I said, you did such a good job. I can't, I don't remember which one I sent you, right side, left side. I said, which is the Weber grill and which is the original hubcap? And there was this long pause and he said, I'm not gonna tell you. 
So to this day, I don't know which hubcap is the Weber grill and which one is the original hubcap. Joe's car is often called Wildcat One because it is the first in a series. After that, they made another concept car called the Buick Wildcat Two, and then the Buick Wildcat Three. They also used the name for production cars, and that was very typical. The uh, name would get popular, and they'd pass it on to production car and would help sales. I mean, that's what it was all about in the end. The production version was part luxury vehicle, part sports car, earning it the nickname, the Banker's Hot Rod. Buick sold half a million of them between 1962 and 1970, but the production model never came close to matching the beauty and elegance of the original dream car.